Okay, let's start our lecture today. Last Wednesday, we started to learn Fourier transform. Uh, the motivation for Fourier transform is that we learned Fourier series in last chapter, but its limitation is it can only be applied to periodic signals. So to analyze the response of a linear time invariant system, for general signals, which might or might not be periodic, we need a uh, more uh, general tool, which is Fourier transform. And we derived Fourier transform actually from Fourier series. For that purpose, when we are given an aperiodic continuous time signal, we first construct a periodic signal, which has the same pattern during one period with that aperiodic signal. And then we make the fundamental period of this periodic signal go to infinity. In other words, we separate the repeated, repeated patterns of the periodic signal so that they are infinitely far from each other. Then we can derive Fourier transform from the Fourier series we learned in last chapter. And we made a series of mathematical derivation to obtain the limit case of Fourier series when capital T goes to infinity, uh, equivalently when omega zero goes to zero. And the result is here in the blue box, that's our Fourier transform. And one thing to notice that in Fourier series, in last chapter, we have discretized frequencies, k omega zero for integers k. But since Fourier transform is the extreme Dream case when omega zero goes to zero, then the k omega zeros becomes inseparable. In other words, becomes continuous. Therefore, Fourier transform is defined on the continuous frequency domain omega. So in particular, X capital X J omega denotes the Fourier transform of the signal X of T because after taking the integral on the right hand side, you will find the result only depends on variable omega. And we can recover the original time domain signal X of T using this integral, which is an integral over continuous variable, over continuous frequency omega. And the result only depends on time variable T. This is called the inverse Fourier transform. And in this lecture, we will continue, uh, we will deepen our understanding for Fourier transform by looking at more examples. So last chapter, we, we uh, already look at this first example with double-sided exponential. Uh, today, let's look at new example. This is a so-called square waveform. Uh, its expression is that x of t equals one between this range minus two plus capital T one divided by two. Uh, capital T one is some constant that's given to you. And everywhere else, x of t equals zero. Now I for convenience, I already list the standard formula for Fourier transform. And the key uh, to solving this problem is calculating this integral. Now I give you two minutes to try to do it yourself and we'll go through it together. Just a reminder that when you try to put omega on the uh, denominator, be careful whether omega is zero or not.
Okay, let's look at the answer together. So we apply the standard formula, uh, which is a integral from minus infinity to infinity. But because x of t is zero everywhere, except within this uh, limited region, minus two plus capital T one divided by two. So we can shrink the integration uh, region. Uh, and in this region, x of t can be replaced by one. And this integral is standard way to for calculate it, but be careful, we can only put minus j omega on the denominator when omega is not zero, uh, omega is not zero. In this case, we can take a difference of exponential minus j omega t between the low, upper lower limit. And here in the numerator, we can apply the corollary of Euler's formula so it equals, because the, the term with minus j omega comes first. So there is a minus sign, minus two j sign this thing on the exponent. And the denominator, everything follows. We can eliminate minus j from both num uh, numerator denominator get a result. That's for omega now equals zero. For omega equals zero, uh, the calculation is actually simpler because exponential minus j zero t is just one. So we have a constant signal one over this given region. The result is just the length of this, re uh, of this interval, right? capital T one. So this finishes our calculation, but I would like to mention that we, you can express the result in a simpler form because of the following. Uh, although x of j omega has different expressions when omega not zero or omega zero, but you can show that when omega is not zero, but it's infinitely close to zero, in other words, omega approaches zero, then the limit of x j omega, the limit of this expression on the first line is identical to the expression on the second line. So how to show that? We are taking a limit of something whose numerator denominator both approach zero as omega approaches zero. And here we need to apply this so-called L'Hopital's rule, which you perhaps learned from your calculator class. This rule says the following. Say we have a something we need to calculate the limit for. On the numerator is fx, on the denominator g of x. What we know is that as x approaches some constant c, both fx and gx goes to zero, or both of them go to infinity. Then to calculate the limit of their ratio when x approaches c, we can take the derivative of f and g over x respectively and calculate the ratio of their derivatives, the limit of the ratio, of the ratio of their derivatives when x approaches c. So applying to our case, we have this expression for which we want to calculate the limit. We take the uh, derivative of the num numerator. So sine becomes cosine because we are taking derivative over variable omega. So don't forget applying the chain rule. We have additional coefficient t1 divided by two. And for the denominator, the derivative of omega is just one. So then this limit as omega goes to zero is more straightforward because cosine zero is just one. The result is two times t1 divided by two, which is t1. So conclusion is even for the omega, for the case omega now equals zero, but as it approaches zero, uh, infinity close, the expression is the same as the second case. So it is okay to just write x of j omega in a more com concise form, just write it in the expression as the first line uh, for all the omega, regardless whether it's zero or not. That's one option for you to make your result look conciser. But be careful when you apply this, uh, uh, this simplification. It, you can only skip the discussion between x, uh, between omega zero or non-zero for continuous frequency omega. And only for the case where the x of j omega is continuous at the particular point omega equals zero. So in this case, only when we can show that the expression in the first line 
goes to the expression of second line when omega approaches zero. Then we can skip the discussion. But this kind of this uh, this kind of simplification cannot be applied to Fourier series we learned in last chapter, because in Fourier series what we had is not continuous frequency. It is a set of discrete frequencies k omega zero for integer case. Uh, therefore, it, it doesn't make sense for integer k to go to zero, right? Because integer k can only be one and then it jumps to zero. It cannot approach uh, infinite close to zero. In other words, there is no concept of continuity in the domain of discrete frequencies k omega zero. That's why for Fourier series, you still need to discuss whether k equals zero or k is not zero. Okay, now let's look at this next example. We have a signal x t, which looks a little bit more complicated. It has exponential term, uh, exponential minus two t times sinusoidal three t times the step unit step u of t. So what is the Fourier transform for this x of t? When you calculate the integral, the first thing to take care of is the step function u of t. But uh, I guess you have done a lot of examples you should have had the sufficient uh, experience dealing with the OT. And the second thing you need to take care of, the sine of 3T, you can convert it using the Euler's formula, convert it, in, it as difference between two imaginary exponentials that will facilitate the calculation of the integral. Okay, uh, let's have two minutes, uh, practice ourselves, and then I'll go through the answer together. Okay, before we come to the answer for this example, let me add some clarification to the last example regarding the discussion of uh, omega equals zero or not, because I received questions from the chat window. Uh, so you don't have to show the limit when omega goes to zero. In other words, in your uh, exam or homeworks, if you just want to leave your answer in this way, uh, by two cases discussions, then it is okay. Uh, only when you want to make your answer look uh, concise or look better, you, you, um, you need to show the limit uh, when, omega, uh, when omega goes to zero because there is condition for, for skip this discussion. Uh, 
But actually, you will find in most of your uh, homeworks uh, that the continuity of x of j omega almost holds for all the cases. But you still need to show that. Otherwise, you cannot simply skip the discussion. OK, uh, the answer for this example. Uh, applying the standard formula, right? we replace x of t with this expression exponential minus j omega t dt integration over minus two plus infinity. And the first thing we can remove u of t because u of t is zero, everywhere t is negative. After removing it, we can at the same time shrink the integration region. So we can discard everything for t negative and only retain the integration for t from zero to plus infinity. And the second thing as the hint said, we can replace sine three of t of uh, sine of three t by this difference between exponential j three t exponential minus j three t, and we can separate the integration in two terms. Right? We need let's make sure we write down the coefficients carefully. Exponential minus two t, uh, copy down here. The first term is plus j three t and then minus j omega t. The second term minus two t the same minus j three t minus j omega t. And there is a minus sign between these two terms, right? Minus sign. And the integration limit, both of them from zero to plus infinity. And we can put the coefficient, right? The coefficient in front of t is minus two plus j three minus j omega. Because of this non-zero real part, uh, this, uh, complex number cannot be zero. So we can safely put it on the numerator, uh, on the denominator. And what is left is exponential. It takes a difference between the lower upper limit integral. And the same thing for the second term, only difference is that we change from plus J3 to minus J3. Okay. So to calculate the exponential when T is plus infinity, We've seen it in the example last chapter, only look at the magnitude of this exponential. But the second, third term, j3 t, j omega t affects the phase angle of this exponential. And the magnitude is only affected by the first term, exponential minus two t. So for which case, t, when t goes to plus infinity, the magnitude or the modulus of this complex number shrinks to zero. Therefore, the entire number goes to zero. And when t equals zero, exponential zero is just one. So zero minus one. And the same actually for the second case, also zero minus one. Notice that I changed this minus sign to plus sign because I extracted the, I eliminate the minus sign in the uh, denominator, right? change everything to plus sign. And this is our answer basically. Uh, of course, you have the option to, uh, for, to merge these two terms so that looks uh, conciser, but it's not mandatory. So I will not show it here. Uh, again, if you look at this result, it's a function of only uh, the continuous frequency omega or it's function of j omega. So we express as x of j omega. So with these two examples, uh, we finished the introduction to continuous time Fourier transform. Right? So far we've learned uh, why we need Fourier transform uh, besides Fourier series and how to derive Fourier transform. And we also look into the relationship between Fourier transform and Fourier series. The key difference is that Fourier series is for periodic signal and it has discretized frequency k omega zero for integer k. But Fourier transform is for a continuum of omega where the difference between uh, frequencies are inseparable. Okay. So now let's move to the second part of this uh, uh, chapter, which uh, introduces some properties associated with continuous time Fourier transform. And the purpose we learned these properties are similar to the properties of Fourier series. That's because we inevitably need to operate some signals over time, right? Time reflection, time scaling, and so on. And 
we don't want to recalculate the Fourier transform uh, by taking that integral. And instead, there are some properties that facilitate us to conveniently obtain the Fourier transform of a signal after relevant time operations. Now let's look at this set of properties. The first property, linearity. Say we are given two continuous time signals, x, t, and y, t. The Fourier transform of them is capital X of j omega, capital Y j omega, respectively. Then we are given a third signal, a new signal, which is also a signal over time t. It's a linear combination of x and y, with a and b being constant coefficient. The Fourier transform of this new signal is nothing but the linear combination of capital X and capital Y with the same coefficients a and b. Why this property hold is actually quite straightforward. Because we are looking at the Fourier transform of this signal, just applying the standard definition, the standard formula for Fourier transform, multiply this signal with exponential minus j omega t, taking derivative over time t. Because in this integral, we can separate them, we can extract the constant outside of the integral sign. So what we have is here. And this part, this integral with only x of t inside, it is the capital X of j omega but by the definition of Fourier transform. And the same, similarly, the second term is B times capital Y of J, which gives our linearity property. Uh, y J omega, not omega. So do you mean the, uh, the expression uh, in the brackets? Okay. Uh, that's just a convention because X at the end of the day, it's a function of omega. But our observation is that omega often appears together with this imaginary operator j. So we, just as convention, we write j omega together. But j is a constant, right? It's, it's just the imaginary operator. Uh, only omega is the variable. Okay. Right, that's just a convention. Okay, so now let's look at an application of the linearity property to a, a special family of, for, uh, of signals. That's periodic signals. So remember that last chapter we learned when we are given a periodic continuous time signal X of T, we can express it as Fourier series. X of T is infinite sum over K each term there is a coefficient a k where, on which we put a lot of efforts to calculate and follow this exponential j k omega zero t where omega zero is the fundamental frequency of that periodic signal. I said that Fourier series does not apply to general aperiodic signals, but Fourier transform does apply to periodic signals. So we, for periodic signal X of T does not only have Fourier series, but also it has a Fourier transform. Now let's look at its Fourier transform. Because X of T is expressed in as a linear combination of exponential functions of T. So we can apply the linearity property of Fourier transform. Basically the Fourier transform of X of T denoted by calibre F X of T is the same linear combination, the same format linear combination, right? It's still the infinite sum over K. Every term of the coefficient is the same, still AK, but we re replace exponential JK omega zero T with its own Fourier transform. And here I give you the result there that the Fourier transform of each individual exponential JK omega zero T is this, delta function, impulse function on the frequency domain. On, it's a delta function of omega. And I will show this result later, but applying this result, the Fourier transform of X of T, just the infinite sum of impulses weighted by AK, and those impulses occurs, occur at K omega zero for integers k. 
but this is the structure of the Fourier transform of f of t. Now let's first prove this result where it does the constant here. So to prove the Fourier transform of exponential j k omega zero t is this thing, we apply the standard formula. Just put this signal in the location of x of t, multiply it with this operator exponential minus j omega zero t, taking integral over dt, then the result should be a function of omega itself. Now we merge these two terms, exponential j, k omega zero minus omega t. So how to calculate this integral? Uh, it's not straightforward, but we can get some intuition from here. Again, this discussion, when omega is k omega zero, then the exponent becomes zero. We are taking the integral of a constant one from minus infinity to plus infinity. So the result should be plus infinity. It's not a finite result. When omega is not k omega zero, then this uh, exponential applying the Euler's formula is a cosine k omega zero minus omega t plus j sine k omega zero minus omega t. And we need to calculate the integral separately for the real part for the cosine and for the imaginary part for the sine. But cosine and sine look quite similar. Let's just look at the cosine, the real part. The cosine signal, when we try to calculate its integral over minus infinity to plus infinity, it is like counting the total area covered by this infinite extending cosine signal. And because of the symmetry, notice that everything below the horizontal axis, the area is counted as a negative number. So because of this symmetry and because the cancellation of positive negative numbers, they intuitively this integral should be zero. But this is just intuition. So it tells us that when omega is k omega zero, then we have something that spikes up to plus infinity. Everywhere else, when omega is not k omega zero, then the result is zero. So the structure of this integral looks quite like impulse that occurs at k omega zero, right? That's why it has a format delta of omega minus k omega zero. So it's an impulse that occurs at k omega zero. But how to rigorously show that? Actually, inverse Fourier transform is useful here to rigorously show this, prove this result. I recall that this is our uh, definition for inverse Fourier transform. It starts from Fourier transform capital X from the right-hand side, taking the integral over omega. Then what is left is a function of time variable t. It happens to be the original signal x of t. Now, let's suppose we already know the result. Two pi dot omega minus k omega zero is our capital X of j omega. In other words, it is the result of Fourier transform. Then we put it in the inverse Fourier transform, hoping that we can recover the original time signal, which is exponential j k omega zero t. So how to calculate this integral? Uh, we've done this a lot of times. Uh, so first let's cancel those co constant coefficients, two pi and one over two pi. And for integral that takes this impulse delta, we know that result is just this function exponential j omega t when omega takes the value where the impulse occurs. The impulse occurs at k omega zero, so we replace omega with k omega zero. The result is exponential j k omega zero t. So using this inverse Fourier transform, we prove that the Fourier transform of exponential j k omega zero t is this two pi times the impulse that occurs at k omega zero. And then we prove this result, we can feel safe to apply it to the Fourier series of x of t to get the Fourier transform of x of t. So just in case you feel confused about the relationship between Fourier series and Fourier transform, I put them together on this slide. We are given a continuous time periodic signal x of t. 
XFT has both Fourier series and the Fourier transform. Fourier series is just what we learned from last chapter. A Fourier transform, so we have this, uh, this dedicated uh, notation, caliber F for Fourier transform. And after Fourier transform is also a function of omega. So as a convention, we write it as X of J omega. Ah, I see where the previous question came from. The, in this case, the omega comes itself without the J, right? But I mean, in, without loss of generality, you can write it as J omega divided by J. So, so J is a, just a constant. So it doesn't matter if we put the J together with omega as a convention. But anyway, we'll come back to the Fourier transform. It is a function of omega itself, right? Can be observed from this. Infinite sum, the coefficient AK, we already calculated them. So AK are constants that are known to us. Omega zero is the fundamental frequency of the signal, which is also a constant. And the K, the in teacher index, does not affect the result because of the infinite sum. So the only variable that affects the result is the continuous frequency omega. That's why Fourier transform is a function of omega. The key difference between Fourier series and Fourier transform is that Fourier series keeps the signal in the time domain. If you look at the Fourier series, it is still a function of time variable t. So both sides are functions of t or both sides are signals of t. That's why we can put the equal sign between them. But Fourier transform changes the signal from time domain to frequency domain. Therefore, it is invalid to just say x of t equals this Fourier transform. We must say f of x t or capital X of j omega equals the Fourier transform, which is a function of omega. So that's the key difference between Fourier series and Fourier transform. But there is also a key relationship between them. The coefficient AK, which we learned how to calculate in last chapter, this coefficient appears in both Fourier series and both Fourier transform. And actually, another similarity between Fourier series and Fourier transform is that they are both an infinite sum over integer index K. Okay, what is the advantage of Fourier series if we still have to calculate AK? Uh, well, I would say that a Fourier transform is a, what is the advantage of Fourier series? Actually, I, will, I like to say the, Fourier, the advantage of Fourier transform. It's a generalization of Fourier series because Fourier transform can be applied to periodic and aperiodic signal but Fourier series can only apply to periodic signal. And both of them can determine the uh, response of a linear time invariant system. So Fourier transform actually has a broader scope of application than Fourier series. Uh, in practice, when you are facing a engineering problem, uh, the uh, first tool you might want to turn to is the Fourier transform instead of Fourier series because of its generality of application. Uh, let's look at an example with the periodic signal X of T. And last chapter, we've obtained its Fourier series where the AK is given. Uh, we need discussion for K equal or non-equal zero. And this chapter, let's calculate the Fourier transform of this signal X of T. Again, this is the result we just learned. Uh, Fourier transform is an infinite sum of impulses. We just apply this result to this particular example. Uh, I'll give you one minute. Uh, let's look at it together then.
Okay, let's look at the result. Uh, the procedure is quite straightforward, just replacing AK with what we already uh, obtained from Fourier series. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, for this particular case, you can observe the fundamental period is two, right? Uh, from minus one to one, it's a period. Therefore, the fundamental frequency omega zero is two pi divided by two, which is pi. Right? That's why we have pi here. And then applying this uh, formula, uh, it's an infinite sum for all the k, but the first observation is that when k is zero, a k is zero. So we can first remove this term k equals zero. So the next step, the summation is taken only for non-zero integers k. For non-zero integers, we can replace a k with this expression in the second line. So this expression and also Inside this impulse, we have k omega zero, but as I said, for this signal, omega zero is pi, so we can replace omega zero with pi. But this is the result, a little bit simplification. So what is the structure of this result? It is an infinite sum for all the impulses that occurs at integer multiples of pi. That means the impulses occur at pi, two pi, three pi, minus pi, minus two pi, minus three pi. And also because k is not zero, so there's nothing at, it, at omega equals zero. And let's look at a particular case, say k equals one. When k equals one, we have minus two j in the numerator, one in the denominator. So it means just a minus two j times a unit impulse that occurs at omega equals pi. So at omega equals pi, the impulse has a minus two j. So this is not a rigorous way to, uh, to show it because, uh, because of this j, right? We are, not supposed, we are not supposed to plot something with j on the, uh, on the uh, real, real number domain like this, but this is just for illustration purpose, not rigorous. Minus two j for this impulse and for k equals minus one, because with this additional minus sign, it becomes positive two j. So at k equals minus one, in other words, omega equals minus pi, the impulse has a coefficient two j. In a similar way, you can calculate the coefficient corresponding to every integer k. But basically, it is a uh, it is a so-called odd signal because of this anti-symmetric structure, right? If we mirror it over the horizontal axis, it also mirroring, it's also mirrored over the vertical axis. Uh, right, but despite the fact that those impulses occurs at a discrete time, discrete highest values, say pi, two pi, three pi, but this X of J omega is still a continuous signal of omega. So omega is continuous variable. When we plot some impulse in the, uh, in the form of arrow, or we, replace, we uh, express it in terms of delta uh, round brackets, always means it is a continuous signal. It is not a discrete time signal. Right? It's not a discrete uh, signal, it's continuous. But it happens that it takes zero value everywhere else say it takes zero value in strictly between zero and pi, strictly between pi and two pi, it's only non-zero, or it's only those impulses at integer multiples of pi. Uh, now let's look at the next property, which is associated with time shifting. We have a signal x of t, whose Fourier transform is x of j omega. Now we shift it by t zero, but we didn't specify whether t zero is positive or not negative. It can be either. If t zero is positive, we are shifting it to the right. If t zero is negative, we are shifting to the left. But regardless of the positive negativeness of t zero, or regardless of the direction of the shift, the Fourier transform takes the same form, a unified form. The original Fourier transform capital X 
in front of it, we multiply exponential minus j omega t0 for the same t0, which is the amount that we shift. So why this property hold? And the proof for it is not hard. Let's look at it together. This is the expression for the original Fourier transform of x of t, at the standard integral. Now we are looking at the Fourier transform of x t minus t0, just to replace x of t with t minus t0. Here we need a substitution variable. So we denote t minus t0 with a new variable tau, so that we can replace x of t minus t0 with x of tau. This t here is tau plus t0, right? t is tau plus t0 from this relationship. And dt becomes the tau plus t0. Because of this step, we already replaced the t with tau. So we replaced, we change it to a new integration variable. At the same time, we need to change the integration limits. So originally the limit is minus infinity to plus infinity. But if, with respect to the new variable tau, because it's t minus t0, the limit has to be changed to minus infinity minus t0 plus infinity minus t0. But it doesn't matter because the result is still minus infinity to plus infinity. And we only keep everything associated with tau inside the integral. So x of tau exponential minus j omega tau d tau. Well, well here d tau plus t0 and d tau are the same thing. When we take the, when we take the uh, derivative, the constant t0 does disappear. Only the variable tau is maintained. And don't forget this additional term exponential minus j omega t0, which you can put outside of the integral. So now what's inside the integral? If we compare this and this, we can find that these two terms are the same, except that here we have integration variable t, here we have integration variable tau. But it does not change the result of this integral. Therefore, this term we are underlined in red is x of j omega, which is the Fourier transform of the original signal x of t. And this gives us the result. This additional term is also variable dependent, uh, depending on frequency omega. And this t0 is given to you when you know how much the signal is shifting. Uh, well, let's have a break here. I'll come back at 12.30 and we'll continue the study of Fourier transforms properties. Right, a lot of the operations, as a student said in the chat window, a lot of those operations are quite similar to what we learned in Fourier series. So from last year's experience, uh, when you learn this course, signals and systems, uh, at first you might encounter some difficulty in some very, in something that needs uh, intuitive and abstract understanding, say the transformation of signals, say the convolution. But once you learn the Fourier series and you are get familiar with the Fourier series, and then when you come to other transforms, whether it's Fourier transform or even Laplace and Z transform, it'll become easier because a lot of operations, just the, uh, the operation with different integrals. We have a continuous time signal, x of t, whose Fourier transform is capital X of j omega. We know that time scaling is to change t to a t. So in chapter one, we learned that uh, if we consider a positive number a, a is larger than one, then we are compressing that signal over time. Uh, otherwise, when a is between zero and one, we are uh, expanding that signal over time. But here, the time scaling property can be more generalized for all the non-zero A's, which can be either positive or negative. And it's 
the same property applies. We take the Fourier transform of X A T, it the result is. So capital X originally it's a function of uh, J omega because this J is a constant. We only focus on the variable omega. After time scaling, we just need to replace this omega with omega divided by A. And the additional coefficient we need to add is one over the absolute value of A because A can be positive or, non or negative. So that's why we need absolute value. So this holds for positive and negative A. As a special case, if we consider A equals minus one, we have X of minus T, which is the time reversal, time reflection. Then applying this general result. So one over absolute value of minus one is one. So the coefficient is just one, nothing. And omega divided by minus one is minus omega, so minus j omega. So that's the special case for a time reversal of sigma, how to obtain its Fourier transform. The proof why this property holds also needs variable substitution. So let's look at the detail. We calculate the for your transform of x a t, so that's x of a t multiply this exponential d t plus minus infinity. Substitute variable, so a t we denoted by the new variable tau. Therefore, we can replace a t here with tau, x of tau. Replace this t with tau divided by a. Replace this d t with d tau divided by a. Again, since we already changed to a new integration variable, we need to change the upper lower limit of integration as well. So originally we are taking the integral for t after multi, but now we are taking the integral over tau. So there is additional a that needs to be multiplied to both upper lower limit. And here that's, we need discussion. When a is positive, the positive number multiplies plus infinity is still plus infinity. The same for negative infinity. Everything else follows from the last step. And here, d, tau, and one over a just split. And the, the constant one over a can be extracted outside of the integral. So one over a is integral exponential. So what we find is that this exponential uh, this uh, integral has the same format of this one, right? The same lower upper limit, the same x of t, everything else the same except that we replace omega with omega divided by a. This is capital X of j omega. So the result of this integral is also capital X of j, but replace omega with omega divided by, by a. So every substitute is equivalent. And because this is the case, A is positive. So it doesn't matter if we change A to A absolute value because they are the same. And this is the result on the right hand side. What if A is negative? When A is negative here, plus infinity times a negative number, it becomes negative infinity. And the negative infinity becomes plus infinity. Everything else follows, but we flip the integration upper lower limit again so that it's from minus infinity to plus infinity. At the same time, there is additional minus sign that we need to add to the integral. So everything else is the same as the case above. So it is the integral itself. It's still capital X of J replacing omega with omega divided by A. But here we have minus A because A is negative minus a is a positive number, which is the absolute value of a. So that's the same expression as the above case, right? A unified expression where we have absolute value of a. Now let's look at a joint application of the three properties we learned so far, linearity, time shifting, and scaling. We have this x of t, which is well, it looks intuitively like a composition of several rectangle or several square wave forms. What is the Fourier transform of X of T? We can apply the previous result, 
Previously, we calculated the uh, Fourier transform for a uh, for a bounded support square waveform. Say if the square waveform is from minus to plus one over two, then the result is here. We can apply this result to our new example with these properties, linearity, time shifting, and time scaling. Uh, let's uh, try to do it ourselves uh, in two minutes. So first decompose X of T as combinations of simple square waveforms. And then see each, if each component is a time scaling or time shifting of what we already calculated for. Okay, how to treat a problem like this? Our first observation is that X of T can be expressed as a linear combination with these two signals, X1 of T and X2 of T. So X1 of T is a square waveform with a height one ranging from two to three. X2 of T is a square waveform, the height is also one ranging from one to four. But in this linear combination, notice that there is additional coefficient 0 0.5 in front of x1, because as you can see, this base part is x2. But above this basement, the height of, of this additional platform from two to three only has, is only 0 0.5. That's why this, we have this coefficient 0 0.5. Okay, now let's, the problem becomes calculating the Fourier transform for x1, x2 individually. Let's first look at x1. x1, as we can observe and compare with the x0, what we already calculated, is a time shifted version of x0. In particular, well, it's only a time shift because x0, this width, the width of this square waveform is one, right? One minus two minus, minus one divided divided by two. And from two to three, the width of the square waveform does not change. The only thing that changes is the center. Of it. We move the center from zero to 2.5. That's why x1 of t is x0 of t minus 2.5. Here we can apply the time shift property with the shift among t0 equal 2.5 in a particular case. So X zero, the Fourier transform of X zero, which is capital X of J omega, already known here, right? From previous result, we just copy it down. And after shifting 2.5, there's just multiplication of additional exponential J omega 2.5. Don't forget that omega is the variable that we need to keep in the exponential. Okay, this is the Fourier transform of X one of T. So what about X2 of T? 
actually two of t is a two-step time operation of x zero t. The first step is to uh, expand x zero t three times. So originally x zero t is from minus one half to one half. And after the expansion, we change t to t divided by three and therefore expanded three times. So minus three divided by two plus three divided by two. We denote this signal as x prime of t. And then x prime of t shifted by 2.5. So the center for x prime, x zero prime of t is zero. Now the new center is 2.5. To the left and to the right, it is 1.5 each. So the left bound is 2.5 minus 1.5 minus 1.5 is 1. The right bound is 2.5 plus 1.5, which is 4. This is exactly x2 of t, right? So you recall that x2 of t is just this platform from 1 to 4, from 1 to 4. So it's also shift by 2.5. Here for the first uh, for the first step for the time scaling, we can apply this property with a equal one over three. So one over a of a slow value becomes one over one over three. So the one over three is put on the denominator. And inside the capital X, we are replacing the Fourier transform of the original signal. We are replacing the omega inside it with omega divided by a. So the Fourier transform of original signal is x of, for x of t is this. Now we replace the omega with omega divided by a, where a is one over three, again, one over three on the denominator. We replace omega with omega divided by one over three. And then we flip the one over three from the denominator to the numerator. And this becomes three, this becomes three omega, becomes three omega. I clean it up a little bit, uh, eliminating the three, both here and here. This is the result. This is the Fourier transform for the intermediate signal, x prime of t. But don't forget we have the second step, which is to shift it by 2.5. Then same as above, we apply the time shifting property just keep this part unchanged, right? We just copy this part here, multiply it by additional exponential minus j omega t0 equals 2.5. This is the Fourier transform for x2 of t. Now we are ready to calculate the Fourier transform of x of t, which is 0.5 x1 of t plus x2 of t. Right? Recall that's our initial decomposition. 0.5 times the result on the last slide for x1 of t plus the result we obtained for x2 of t. This is the Fourier transform for this complicated signal x of t. We calculate it using the decomposition and linearity property. And we can simplify the result a little bit, extracting the common factor exponential minus j omega, j2.5 omega and 0.5 and 2 just Result is one, so can clean up the result a little bit. This is a joint application of the three properties we learned so far. The next property, which I will not uh, use a concrete example uh, to practice, but uh, something good for you to know, it's called Passivars relation. So we have a signal X of T over time and then its Fourier transform is capital X of J omega. And if we calculate this integral, we take the magnitude of X of T. If X of T is real, then it's the absolute value of X of T. Take its magnitude, square it, and take the integral of the square from minus infinity to plus infinity. So this integral of the absolute square has a name, it's called the energy of the signal. 
and the observation of mathematician is that the energy of signal calculated on the time domain over integral of t is the same as its energy calculated over the frequency domain. So to be specific, we have this its Fourier transform, which is capital X, a function on the continuous frequency domain omega. Again, we take its magnitude, take the square, and take the integral for omega ranging from minus infinity plus infinity. And these two integral are the same with this constant factor one over two pi. And to understand it better, we can replace omega divided by two pi by f. So we always say that omega is the frequency, but in practice, the unit, the default unit for omega is a reading per second. Say if omega equals four pi reading per second, it means something is rotating for four pi readings per second. We know that two pi readings correspond to one cycle. So we divide omega by two pi, we obtain two cycles per second. Cycle per second has another name, it is hertz. So omega equals four pi reading per second or f equals two hertz, they correspond to the same rotational speed. So that's why we can replace omega divided by two pi by, with a single frequency f. And omega can be replaced by two pi f which is an alternative representation of capital X in the F domain. It's also the frequency domain, just the scale of the battle factor. And if we represent it in F domain, then we can absorb, we can eliminate this factor two pi. And the result looks more obvious. The integral of X square in time domain equals the integral of capital X in the F domain. Intuitively, the total energy of the signal can be computed equally in time domain and frequency domain. After the domain transformation, the energy of the signal does not change, remains constant. That's what passing values relation says. So there's no problem for you to be examined regarding this relationship, but this is an important relationship uh, you might see, you might use in future engineering practice. That's why I would like to mention it here. Okay. Now let's look at the next set of properties that are associated with, uh, that are associated with uh, differentiation and integration. Again, we have a continuous time signal X of T whose Fourier transform is capital X of J omega. Now what happens if you take the integral of x of t? x of t is a signal of time t, so it's dx dt. And what we found is that the Fourier transform of dx dt is also related to capital J omega. It's just a multiplying x of j omega with additional operator j omega. And this can further imply the higher order derivatives of x. So we have a kth order derivative of x. So dkx dtk, then it's Fourier transform, just multiplying capital X with jk to the power, uh, j omega to the power k. Because every time we lift the order up for the derivative, there is one additional j omega that multiplies to the result. Therefore, the kth order we have k, j omega multiplied k times. And what about the integral? Because differentiation and integration are inverse operations. If we take the integral of x, so denoted by x tau d tau, and here notice that we must have this correct limits of integration. Th this property in the uh, rule box only holds for the particular limits of integration from minus infinity to t. So after taking this integration, tau does not impact the result. And the result is a function of t, only relies on the upper bound t of the integration. 
So the left hand side is a time signal. It's also a signal over time t. For that signal, the Fourier transform is this. The first part is not hard to understand given the property above, right? Taking derivative, it multiplies J omega. Then if you take integral, which is the inverse operation with derivative, then divided by J omega. But there is the second term, which is associated with our particular choice of the integration lower upper limit, which says the constant pi times x of, j, x of zero, which is the x of j omega just replacing omega with zero. So the particular value of Fourier transform at omega equals zero times a impulse that occurs at time zero. So delta omega is a unit impulse that occurs on the frequency omega axis. And in particular, this impulse occurs at omega equals zero, right? That's a standard notation for a unit impulse. Okay. Uh, the derivative, uh, the, the derivation of the integration property is a little bit involved is beyond the scope of this, like this class. So I will skip it here. I only show you a simpler case, which is the derivation with the differentiation property. So we take the, we, we, have, we know that Fourier transform X of T is capital X. Now what is the Fourier transform of dx dt? Uh, dx, here we apply the inverse Fourier transform. The first line of equation, just the definition of inverse Fourier transform starts from capital X on the right-hand side, taking the integral, the result is only a function of variable T. So it's the original signal X of T. Taking the derivative X of T, taking the d, dt on the right-hand side, we can move the differentiation over t inside the integral. Of course, there are some mathematical conditions for this movement to be rigorous, but we always assume this condition holds in our class. So the only place that variable t appears is in this exponential j omega t. Therefore, when we move the d dt inside, it only applies to this exponential. And we know that taking this exponential over t it's just the exponential itself with the additional coefficient j omega. And if you look at this expression, it's the standard expression for inverse Fourier transform, two pi, one over two pi is the same, integration is the same over d omega, exponential j omega t is the same. The only thing different is that we have a function of omega, which is x of j omega times j omega. So that's the inverse Fourier transform of x of j omega times j omega. And then the inverse Fourier transform, we move it to the left-hand side. We know that the Fourier transform of dx dt is j omega times x of j omega. The application of this differentiation property is the calculation of Fourier transform for the unit impulse, the unit step. Recall that we have delta of t, which is the unit impulse, u of t, which is the unit step we learned from chapter one. So the relationship between delta and u is that delta is derivative of u. u is the integral of delta from minus infinity to t, yeah, which you can check the slides of chapter one, how we obtain these properties, this relationship. Now, using this property, using this integration property, we can calculate the Fourier transform for delta, which is denoted the capital delta of j omega, and the Fourier transform of u, which is denoted capital U of j. Okay. So, Let's first try to do it ourselves. Calculate the Fourier transform of delta just using the standard formula, which needs to take an integral. 
and then calculate the Fourier transform U using this integration property because U is the integration of delta. Let's have two minutes for that and we'll look at it together. Okay, seems some student, uh, some students are interested in, oh, so two questions. One is, what is energy of signal uh, for? So an example of the energy of signal. The other is why there is extra term in the integration property. Well, uh, let me try to add some slides to the, uh, after the lecture. And I'll put the revised slides to the to the blackboard. Because of time limitation, is uh, I, I cannot uh, explain in much detail in class. Okay, let's look at first how to calculate the Fourier transform of the unit in power signal delta of t. Uh, just replace delta in the location where it should be, uh, multiplies exponential dt. Although the integration is over minus infinity to plus infinity, because of this delta function in the integral, we know that result is simply exponential minus j omega t, where t is replaced by where the impulse occurs. It occurs at time zero, replace t with zero, the result is one. So indeed, we calculate capital delta as a function of uh, continuous frequency omega, but the result is a constant one. If you plot delta j omega, looks like this. Over the omega axis, it's a constant value one, a flat signal. This is the Fourier transform of the unit in pulse. And then we apply the integration property to calculate the Fourier transform of unit step. So unit step U is the integration of unit in pulse delta. To apply this property, we must make sure that the lower upper limit of the integral is from minus infinity to T, right? From minus infinity to T, that satisfies our condition to apply this property. So we, we just apply this property, replace capital X with capital delta, capital X with capital delta. Because delta of capital delta of J omega is one, so it's one over J omega as the first term. For the second term, it's pi times delta of zero. So at the particular point omega equals zero, delta zero is also one. So it's also one delta omega. So this is our result. The first term is something with the J omega on the denominator. The second term is just the standard impulse at the frequency omega domain multiplies a coefficient pi. Now we can validate the correctness of this result by looking, by utilizing the in differentiation property because delta the impulse is the time derivative of the step u. So delta equals du dt. So the Fourier transform of delta, the capital delta, is the Fourier transform of u, capital U, multiplies additional geomic. This applies this property here. 
if it's differentiation, just the multiplies additional j omega. And the result capital U, we already calculated that multiplies j omega, the first term becomes one. The second term, so it's j omega times delta omega. So we can discuss delta omega in two cases. When omega is not zero, delta omega is just a zero. When omega is zero, delta omega is an impulse, it's a spike. But this spike is further multiplied by j omega, which is j zero, because we are looking at omega equals zero. Everything multiplies zero, the result is just zero. So the second term is just the sig zero signal everywhere after the two case discussion. And the result is just one. So delta of j omega equals one, which is consistent with what we obtained above. So it is a partial validation that our calculation is correct. Yes. So for the, as someone correctly pointed out in the chat window, for the time domain in power signal, it is a composition of signals from all the frequencies. So that, as you can see from here, so the component with all the frequency exists. Only when we add them up together with the same weight, so weight means the magnitude or the coefficient in front of every component frequency. Only when we add all of them up, we can obtain the impulse. Let's look at additional application of the integration property. We have this signal x of t, a square waveform for which the uh, Fourier transform we already calculated. But this time we want to calculate this Fourier transform in a different way. Notice that this square waveform can be expressed as the difference between two step signals. So the first step signal jumps from zero to one at a point minus t divided, t1 divided by two. So it's u of t plus t1 divided by two. The second signal is the step that jumps at the point t1 divided by two. So that's why it's a time shifted version of ut to t1 divided by two. The difference between these two signals is just what's in between this platform, this square waveform. And because both u jumps to height one and the difference only has height one, that's why we need multiply by two to get a signal with height two. So this is the expression of this x of t. Now we have a signal g of t, which just replaces the u with delta. So we have two impulses. One occurs at minus t1 divided by two, one occurs at plus t1 divided by two. The one that occurs at minus t1 divided by two is this one, the first one. So it is pointed to the bottom, to the, to the top with high two. And the second term with a minus two, so pointed to the bottom, minus two. And the observation is that when we take the derivative x of t, dx dt equals gt. And if we take the integral of gt, so g tau d tau from minus infinity to t, notice again, we use the particular lower upper limit of in this integration. This integral happens to be x of t. You can check it by yourself. Basically, when we take the integration, before this point, minus t1 divided by two, we take the integration from minus infinity up to t, but the result is still zero because we are taking the integral of, of a constant zero value. Only when t reaches this minus t1 divided by two, it encounters this impulse, it can jump from zero to two. That's first, that's where the first step rises from. And similarly, you can check that with a negative impulse, it drops back to zero. Now with this relationship, we can first calculate the Fourier transform of G of T 
then x of t. So I will leave you two minutes to practice yourself because the Fourier transform g of t, you can apply the standard Fourier transform for unit impulse and the time shift property, actually the linearity property, both linearity and time shift. So try to do it yourself first. Okay, let's look at the Fourier transform of GT first. Uh, for convenience, I put a previous result here. So the standard delta of T is Fourier transform is constant one over constantly one over omega axis. So G of T is two G one of T minus two G two of T. So uh, two new signals G one G two are introduced. G one is a unit impulse that occurs at minus t1 divided by 2. G2 is also unit impulse because here it has a uh, has a value positive 1, but it occurs at plus t1 divided by 2. So there is a minus sign because in the result g, this is uh, pointing to the negative direction. And don't forget to multiply with two for both G1 and G2, because this is two, this is minus two, but this is one, this is one, right? That's why we have two here. The G1 of T is just the delta of T shifted to the left by T1 divided by two. So applying this time shift property, T0 here, okay. So X of T minus T0, is the format of this property. But we have here t, delta t plus t1 divided by two. So in this case for g1, t0 equals minus t1 divided by two. So we replace t0 with minus t1 divided by two, two, ne two negative signs so we can cancel them. The result is exponential plus j omega t1 divided by two times capital delta. What is capital delta? We know that it is one from the previous result. This is the result. This is the Fourier transform for G1. And similarly, Fourier transform for G2, apply this time shift property again, but G2 is delta T minus T1 divided by two. So we replace T0 with T1 divided by two. Replace T0 with T1 divided by two. The result is exponential minus J omega block. And again, delta, capital delta is one. So this is the result. Now we can calculate the Fourier transform of G applying the linearity is two times G1 minus two times G2, which is two times the first result minus the second result. And for this thing inside the brackets, we can apply the corollary of all this formula. It equals two J sine omega T1 divided by two. Therefore, the final result is 4G because of additional two here. 4G sine omega T1 divided by two. This is the Fourier transform of the signal G of T, which is the combination of two impulses. But 
our ultimate goal to calculate the Fourier transform of x, which is the integral g. That's where we apply the integration property. I just put down the property here. Uh, the first term, g capital G of j omega divided by j omega. So the result of capital G above divided by j omega. The second term, pi here, g zero. What is g zero? It is this result replacing omega with zero. So we have sign zero here in particular. And then multiply the impulse delta of omega. Again, we are multiplying a signal with a constant zero because sine of zero is zero. The result is zero. Basically this G of zero eliminates the second term and the result only keeps the first term uh, which is sinusoidal signal divided by omega. Actually, it is consistent with the previous result where we directly calculated, what, which we directly calculated from the definition of Fourier transform. Right, the previous result is two times sine signal divided by omega, if you still remember. Here we have four because the height of this signal is modified to two is from one. Uh, well, the time is not enough to cover the next example. So I will just stop here. Let's have an early release today. I will see you on Friday. Let's continue looking at some examples for Fourier transform. Okay, thanks. See you Friday.